you do. Psalm, if you will, chapter 24, so 24th Psalm. Uh, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Uh, for he is founded upon the seas and established it upon the floods. God made it all. God made everything we see. He made the whole lot. Uh, I don't know if you saw the uh, sad news from the United Nations the other day, but currently there are one million species on earth which are on their way to extinction. I don't think that includes humans either, by the way. Just one million natural creatures on their way to extinction as of today. I find that very, very sad. Uh, others, of course, may not, may not be worried. Um, someone said to me the other night, they said, oh, I don't watch the news anymore. <laughs> it's just too sad. It's too, you know, horrible. Things that are happening around the world, and I don't blame you. It seems to be just getting crazier and crazier. In an age where we perhaps would normally be thought of as becoming a little bit more, you know, sensible, maybe even intellectual, whatever, uh, the world is heading in the wrong direction. And uh, the Bible warns us about these sort of things elsewhere. The Bible talks about all the things we see, wars, rumours of wars, earthquakes, famines, diseases and so forth. Uh, you, you sort of look at all the diseases at the moment and I'm feeling sick just watching the news of what's coming next. You know, monkey pox and all that sort of stuff and you kind of think, goodness mate, where is this going to end? Um, but the Lord says, you and I are safe. He says, we're in the palm of his hand. The Bible says that we belong to God. We're special. We're unique. And here he says, that's right, I've made everything. The earth is the Lord's. Verse 3, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place? And he now sort of pivots a little bit to describe those that are going to go not just on earth, we've all enjoyed earth to some degree or another, but he says rather those that are going to enjoy heaven. Who will ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul to vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the Lord God of, this, of his salvation. And uh, when we first read this, we think, yes, yes, good thought here, heading up to meet the Lord in the air, rising up to be with him and so on, until you read the next verse, he that has clean hands and a pure heart. And then you start to doubt yourself and you start to think, whoa, hang on, that's going to make it pretty tough. People that are pure hearted and never think any wrong things or do any wrong things or say any wrong things. And that is a theme that comes out right through the book of Psalms here that I just want to explore for a moment or two, if we can, uh, over to Psalm 40, because the psalmist goes on to write of, of how difficult it is to be like that. Psalm 40, verse 12, just a few verses from Psalms before we sort of launch into the New Testament, if you don't mind. Uh, Psalm 40, verse 12. For innumerable evils have compassed me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me, so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of mine head. Therefore my heart faileth me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. And the psalmist writes here that as he thinks about himself and his inadequacies, he starts to recognise he has failings in his life. And he starts to top them up. And before he knows it, he suddenly thinks, more, they're more than the hairs on my head. Now, that's, that's okay if you're bald. If you're bald, it's all right. You're safe, apparently. But what he's saying here is your, hair, your, your hairs on your head, I won't say they're innumerable, you can count them, but there's an awful lot of them up there. And what he's reminding us here is that's how our sin starts to feel, starts to weigh us down, it starts to become uh, an anchor to us. And he says in verse 12 there, my iniquities have taken hold upon me. Uh, another uh, writer tells us over in the book of Proverbs, they're like legs, uh, well, legs, they're like ropes around our legs, our iniquities, our failings. They seem to trip us up, pull us over. And here he says, my sins have taken hold upon me so that I'm not able to look up. What a sad state that humans get to the point where we can no longer feel confident to look up to God. We're no longer able to feel uh, that uh, God will accept our you know, uh, prayers and our, our requests and so on. 
It's getting harder and harder to get up to the hill of the Lord is what the psalmist is telling us. Over again, if you will, Psalm 51, just across the page. There is some relief coming in this story. It's not all doom and gloom, but I've just got to start off here to make a point or two. Psalm 51, verse 2. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee only, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And uh, the psalmist here writes that we actually had no chance. It's not like we started off with a series of options of, I think I'll be a perfect, holy, righteous person versus, uh, you know, a sinner or something or other. He says, actually, you were, you were born in sin. That's the human condition. That's where we are. He says, uh, uh, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Uh, that, that was uh, how we began and that's how we continued through our life. Different ones perhaps have tried to do better and perhaps, you know, uh, invested effort in some of the more, you know, holy things, you know, maybe got involved in charities, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but the psalmist reminds us here it's just not possible to break free. It's not possible to break the mould. The mould is set. Humans have this uh, very, very overwhelming sense of conscience. Most humans do. Uh, verse 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop. Hyssop is a, a type of a branch, you know, a stick off a tree sort of thing, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. And uh, the psalmist here writes that if God intervenes in some way, there's a chance that we could be whiter than snow, which is really, really, really white. Anyone not seen snow here, been in the snow, been in the snow? I think everyone would have been, maybe one or two. Uh, it's, it's, uh, when you first see the snow, it's, it's just glaringly white. That's the surprising part about it. It's not white, it's, it's just it's glaring, it's sparkling, it's shining in your face. In fact, it's, uh, I remember years ago, I took the family, we ended up up in uh, Switzerland, and uh, skiing, no, walking. And uh, I remember I had a memory from a child that if, you, if you're not careful, you end up getting burnt. And so I told everybody, stick a hat on. So we all had hats on in the snow. But I forgot, that's not actually how, what stops you getting burnt. It reflects up off underneath you. And my daughter ended up with third degree burns as a result of that. Um, but she was naughty that weekend. Uh, just putting it out there. Anyway, so the point, of course, is that how white is it? It's, it's, it's blindingly white. You can actually become sort of blind from it. And the Lord says here, that's right, I'm going to make you whiter than snow. I'm going to purge you. I'm going to release you from it. I'm going to break the mould here. Uh, a little further down in the same passage, or back in verse 1 rather, "'Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness.'" According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. And we, we read here the first clues in the Bible that God has got a plan in place to rescue us from sin. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit this morning. And the plan is that he uh, always intended to send Jesus to die for our sins. And that even in the Old Testament, uh, where the law was so strict and, uh, you know, prescriptive, you know, 623 laws associated with what you could and could not do. And each of those that was broken required various uh, uh, sacrifices to be made and so on before you felt close to God again. But even back in the Old Testament, he makes it clear that it's going to be based upon God's mercy, God's loving kindness, God's generosity towards our failed state. Wash me, verse 2, thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And the psalmist recognises that I can't do it myself. You know, you sometimes see pictures of maybe people up in the Philippines getting crucified at Easter time, trying to get 
kind of close to God or holy, or I'm not quite sure exactly why they do it, uh, but whatever they do it for, or maybe over in uh, Rome at St. Peter's there, walking up St. Peter's steps up to the basilica on their knees till their knees bleed. You know, it's a traditional thing you do, and if, they, if you have a look, you're at the top and they didn't bleed, well, go back down again and start again until they do. That's the gist of it. In other words, you're the one that's going to take the punishment for your sin. You're the one that's going to somehow make amends in the sight of God. And the Bible tells us very clearly in the book of Psalms, all our righteousnesses, and yes, it is in the plural, all our righteousnesses are like what to God? Filthy rags. So all the things that we could do, as it were, you know, improving ourselves and maybe getting involved in charity or good works or something or other, they're all eventually simply going to be like filthy rags in the sight of God. And that's why the Bible over and over makes mention of the fact that it's actually God we need to look to to release us from this sin, from this guilt. Uh, he goes on in verse uh, 3. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. It's always a worry when someone comes to the Lord and they say, oh, I've never done anything wrong. <laughs> yes, I'll get a bit older. You'll get used to it. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's worrying if we come to God. No, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm almost holy. I'm pretty righteous. Good luck with that. I mean, that's crazy. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. All are inadequate. And whereas we as human beings tend to sort of qualify people and perhaps start to grade them, you know, like grading apples at a, at a, at a shed or something or other, and we say, well, yes, sir, this person's about a 6.5. They're pretty good. He's about a 9. Actually, I don't never met a 9 in my life, by the way. Uh, they're about a 7.5 or so. And, uh, yes, I've met quite a few people down at, uh, well, I nearly mentioned the name of a suburb then, but that wouldn't be very helpful, would it? I'd pick a north of the river one, maybe. Um, you know, I've got a lot of people from Port Hedland, and uh, they, they were threes and fours, most of them. And of course, that's not how God sees it. You're either one or zero. There is no sliding scale. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I spent a lot of time out at uh, prison, not in prison, but out at prisons, and uh, in particular, the one that comes to my mind is out at uh, Bandy up there, the ladies' prison, down at um, uh, Swan Valley there. And uh, the different women that you'd meet down there who got caught versus the ones on the outside who didn't get caught, and uh, they range from uh, drug dealers through to serial killers. And uh, you sit there and chat with them and so on. And uh, it's, it's amazing. There's no question that people in general have this sort of scale concept. Yes, the ones in prison are the really bad ones. They're about a one and a half. And uh, I'm on the outside, so I'm about a seven. And the Lord just says it's not true. Uh, all have sinned against thee. In verse 3, I acknowledge my transgression, my sin is ever before thee. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in, this, in thy sight. And uh, the Bible reminds us, it's not about people, it's about you and your relationship with God. Thee, against thee, have I done this. Uh, he goes on, we'll go to another passage just for a moment though. Over in uh, Psalm 86, just for a moment. How am I going for time? Yeah, it's okay. Psalm 86. Psalm 86, down in verse, uh, well, yeah, just one verse here for time this morning. Psalm 86, verse 15. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. And all the people said, that's what God is. He's a God full of compassion and mercy He's a God who uh, is happy to forgive us, happy to uh, lift us up, happy to rescue us, happy to change our lives. Uh, it's based on what we do, though, in the sense that the Bible says that once we draw near to God, we come with uh, a contrite heart. 
uh, we come in humility. If we come to God telling him how good we are, we get nothing. But if we come to God telling him that we, we recognise that we're not in the right uh, you know, arena sort of thing, the right ballpark, then God is full of compassion and mercy. Uh, that's his nature. He created us in the first place. He knew what was coming. Uh, over in Psalm 103, just for a moment, another favourite passage of mine. Psalm 103, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And uh, sadly, one of, one, of the, one of the human's most obvious failings is we forget stuff. We forget to be thankful. We forget what someone's done for us or whatever it is, in this case, God. And the Lord says, uh, forget not all his benefits. Uh, who forgiveth all thine iniquities. And just stop there for a moment because that's what God does. He's prepared to forgive all your iniquities. Sometimes we have this thing that, yes, well, God's forgiven this and this and this and this, and most of those are pretty straightforward, but uh, there's a couple of dark, you know, spots in my background that I don't think I'll ever forget. And the Lord says here, well, actually, I do. I forgive. I forget. I put it behind me. In fact, the only person still hanging on to it sometimes is you. And you need to think how God thinks. We've got the mind of Christ. We need to think how Christ thinks about us. And he says, he forgives all our iniquities. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness. Sorry, verse, uh, verse 3. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Praise the Lord. God's the great healing God. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. And although we sort of all grow up with this image of God being a, a, you know, a, a, an awful tyrant up there, he's in heaven just looking to squash people like a kid on the footpath squashing ants. The Bible picture is of God who is a very compassionate, caring, forgiving God, not the other. Uh, there's elements of both, clearly, but the, in terms of our relationship with him, this is what he's offering. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He won't hold it against you. He's not like that. It's not how he thinks. Uh, he has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. He's not punished us in proportion to our failings. He's not uh, sat there and worked out, uh, you know, that sort of a punishment. That's not how it's worked. You know, uh, 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 for as a f in verse 12, for as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Okay, so there's the east over there. There's the west over there. All of your sins are over there and you're over there. In another place it says he's put your sins in the sea of forgetfulness. They're gone. Our job now is to simply thank him and rejoice. And all the people said. Uh, sometimes even people that get spirit filled sit there, you know, ruining their, you know, uh, uh, inadequacies. And the Bible picture is stop it. Uh, Jesus died to rescue you. Stop this sitting, being miserable about yourself. That's not going to help anything. Your job is to give thanks. Your job is to rejoice. Your job is to reflect on the fact that uh, your sins are as far away as the east is from the west. Verse 13, like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. And that's probably one of the, my favourite verses in the whole Bible. Um, uh, I mean, we've all had things we did as kids, haven't we, where, you know, dad came out and could have done his nan or whatever, but instead just gave you maybe a clip behind the ear and sent to your bedroom or something or other. Um, we all had those sort of things. I mean, I remember years ago, I pestered my mother to let me drive her car. I hadn't gotten my licence yet. And she said, you're going to wreck it, you're going to wreck it. And I said, no, 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 I've got this covered. I know how to do this. In theory, I know how to do all of this. And in theory, I did. 
In practice, I crashed it into the garage. And of course, you kind of, at the time, you know, well, like, like most kids, I mean, I, was, I might have been 17 or something or other, I probably had a long string of failures as a child up to that point in time. But you, you, you kind of it reminds you from scripture, you know, my mother just sort of looked at me, looked at the garage, looked at the car, said, turn it off now. She put the car back in the garage. She, she might have said something like, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to dock you out of your pocket money for the rest of your life for that or something or other, but didn't ever do it. And it kind of reminds you that that's what God is like. You know, he, what's it say? Like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. You've almost, you know, you almost need to have kids to understand how God feels about us in the sense that you know how generous you are towards your kids. You know how, you know, uh, you know, kind you are. You overlook things and so on. That's exactly like God, exactly like God. Uh, many times I can remember sitting in prison there. No, I was visiting. I wasn't there. Sitting in prison there during visiting hours, perhaps, and people who are absolute criminals in our society, you know, they might have been, um, you know, uh, well, as I say, you know, murderers and, you know, drug dealers and all that sort of stuff. And uh, at prison time, at, at visiting time, in would come their mother and father and sit there having a, a warm, friendly chat with them. They weren't holding it against them. And you think, whoa, okay. It's not like they went out, sat at the desk, and then nobody came in that day. Their mum and dad just came in, as usual. Now, don't get me wrong, am I condoning those things? No, clearly not. But I'm simply pointing out there is a relationship between parents and children which is unique. And uh, the, uh, the principle, of course, is God did that so we would start to understand how he feels about us. He's our father, and all the people say. He doesn't sit there accumulating all of your failures and sins. He has forgiven you. Like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. Verse 14, for he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. He, he rec recognises that we're just humans. You know, we're not kind of built of titanium or something or other or, you know, have some massive computer brain. We're just human beings. That's all we are. He recognises that and he says, I'm dealing with you accordingly. In the New Testament, he says, for the Father himself loveth you, in the Gospel of John. Uh, we know the famous one in John 3, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. But elsewhere in John, it says, for the Father himself loveth you. So in John chapter 1, we do need to get to the New Testament eventually. John chapter 1, and I know that you know that I know that you know that this is all about Jesus dying for our sins, and it is, and that's at the heart of it. And hopefully that every morning your first prayer just about should be, thank you, Lord, for dying for all my sins, all of them, past, present, and even future. Because it tells us here in John chapter 1, and I'm not going to spend hours on this, but John chapter 1 in describing Jesus, verse 29. The next day John sees Jesus coming to him and he saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. That's astonishing. At the, before Jesus' ministry had even begun, before he'd performed any miracles, raised anybody from the dead, walked on water, turned the water into wine, before all of that, John the Apostle was announcing this is the Lamb of God, the sacrifice that God has sent to take away the whole world's sin, to pay for every sin that every man, woman and child will com commit and ever commit upon the face of the earth. Behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. And as I say, sometimes even spirit-filled people start to grapple with things and look back on their past and regret this and regret that. Well, okay, regret it if you like. But Jesus died for it. That's the simple truth. He's forgiven you for it. That's the simple truth. He died for the sin of the whole world. I mean, you and I are happy to put in there, yes, he died for Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin and Idi Amin. Some of you young people are looking askance at me, clearly. They're old, old people who did really bad things. 
Give me strength. And he died for all of those people guilty perhaps of millions of murders. I mean, Joseph Stalin, for example, I mean, they say he's probably guilty of about 11 million murders, give or take a million. You know, these, these characters are just, you know, um, astonishingly, breathtakingly uh, evil in time. And yet Jesus died for all their sins. And we're happy to say that sometimes that he died for, you know, who remembers Idi Amin? 11 of you, okay. Clearly I'm showing my age now. Uh, another dictator from Africa who used to just butcher people endlessly. Um, <clears throat> Another Collingwood supporter, I think, from memory. And, of course, we're happy to accept that that's exactly what Jesus died for, these terrible villains. And what happens, though, is we look back on our life and we say, oh, I'm a bit worried about <gasps> committed that sin five years ago and that sin 20 years ago and that sin 42 years ago. And we sit there grappling with it and the Lord says, hang on, he died for the sins of the whole world. There's nothing left out. The Son of God on earth. Uh, elsewhere, he's referred to as the firstborn of every creature. And that's a little clue for us. It's reminding us that the firstborn of every creature was due to be sacrificed to God. You know, your firstborn sheep, your firstborn cows, your firstborn horses, whatever they were, they all had a system in place where they'd be either sacrificed or paid for. And uh, your, maybe the budgie in your lounge room had chickens and its firstborn was belonged to God and so on. And what he's reminding us is that it's as if every firstborn creature in history doesn't tot up to the value of Jesus Christ dying for our sins. And all the people said. It was huge. The father, the, his father turned his face away. Uh, in another place it talks about Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? when he was being crucified. And the answer is really simple, because in that split second of time, he represented all the sins of history, all the sins of mankind. Now, God has made it clear from the very beginning how merciful he is, that he was prepared to forgive us. Why did he need to send Jesus? My suspicion is because by sending Jesus, it helps us to recognise it's all covered. All of it is covered. We would never have any further doubts about it. We'd never sort of be wondering, is perhaps that not covered or that not covered? Because in Jesus dying, we understand once and for all, that's the ultimate that God could have sacrificed to rescue us. Far better than a couple of sheep and a heifer and a, you know, a turtle dove or something or other, the Son of God himself. Verse 29, the next day John sees Jesus coming to him and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of of the world. A couple of things there. The first one is taketh away. The Greek is bears away, carries away. In other words, he's removing, bearing away. The second one is behold. You've got to just stop and think about that for a moment. What he's saying is, would you please just look at Jesus? He's the one who's carrying away the sins of the world, carrying away your guilt and your inadequacies and your sense of failure and so on and so on. Uh, behold the Lamb of God. To another New Testament one, 2 Corinthians 6. How am I going for time? Squeeze a couple more verses in. 2 Corinthians 6. Oh, chapter 5, rather. 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 17, Therefore, if any man be of, in Christ, he is a new creature, Old things are passed away, behold, all things have become new. And contained in that verse are the, the amazing seeds of our future with the Lord. Uh, the old things are passed away. There's a new creature begun. It says your spirit and God's spirit have blended together to make a new person. The new person inside of you now is indestructible, will go on forever and ever. Thank God. And he says to us, all things have become new, verse 18, and all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And he's telling us here our job is to help people find their way back to God. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. And if you perhaps struggle thinking about Jesus' mortality versus his his uh, divinity and so on. Here's a good verse that helps you. God was in Christ. God was in Christ, 
reconciling the world unto himself. In other words, that's who died on the cross. I'll leave that thought hanging for a moment. Uh, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And that, that little statement is just astonishing. Uh, you know, we know a fair bit about, you know, imputing. We, these days in accountancy and so on, you have dividend imputation and you have other imputations and so on. The whole idea is you, you ascribe a value to something. You write something down for something. And what he's saying here is he's no longer imputing their trespasses to them. But hey, you got baptised and filled with the Spirit, according to Scripture, you died in the waters of baptism. You think I'd shout myself a cake when I have a flat white this morning? Or perhaps uh, uh, there's so many other ways that things can be imputed to you. And in, in our case, we're in this position where God says, all of my goodness is imputed to you. It's on your record now. And we're no longer talking about our goodness our, or badness for that sake, but rather God's. And that's why I love the way the psalmist concludes here. Psalm 71, if you will, uh, just verse 16, two verses, verse 16. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. I love that. We're no longer talking about me, my goodness, my badness, my shortcomings, whatever it is. We're talking about God's. It's perfect. Hebrews 10 says that he has perfected us forever. Thank God. Uh, Romans 3 talks about his righteousness, not, and then he repeats it, he says, that is his righteousness, not ours. And now he says, that's right, we're only going to talk about God's righteousness from now on, what Jesus did for us. Verse 24, my tongue also shall talk of thy righteousness all the day long. You know, sometimes people get a bit irritated with you. They say, I wish you'd shut up about righteousness and being filled with the Spirit and forgiven and all that sort of stuff. Hang on, hang on, hang on. 3,000 years ago, the psalmist reminded me that what I'm supposed to be doing is talking about his righteousness all day long. And all the people said, we've been washed, we've been set free, we've been clean, we've been imputed with Christ's righteousness. We enjoy it, we love it, we want to give him the glory.